Our very first panel discussion, the topic for this panel discussion is Government Summit, State of Blockchain Regulation in Asia. And we will have six to seven distinguished guests on stage and share their opinions with the audiences here today. Now, when I read your name, can you please also proceed onto the stage? First of all, let's welcome our moderator, Angie Lau, Forecast News founder and CEO. Welcome, Angie. Thank welcome. Thank you. Let us welcome Joshua Ashley Clayman, Clayman founder and CEO. Welcome. And next, let us welcome Jason Shu, again, member of Parliament Legislator and Crypto Congressman in Taiwan. Naokazu Takemoto, member of the House of Representatives for Osaka Congressman here in Japan. Please proceed on to the stage. Welcome. 那么最后一位呢, SFA Chairman. Good morning. 好, 我们现在呢, 都我们的与会嘉宾呢, 现在全部呢, 台上了,那么待会儿呢,就会进行今天的第一场高峰论坛 And now, I'm going to pass it on to our moderator, Angie And now let the panel discussion begin Wonderful, thank you We also have Jason Xu, I believe Who's also coming up on the panel, is he not? Okay, we will, we will take it from here Good morning everybody, how's everyone doing today? We're going to kick things off. It was, um, it's been a very interesting month, year in cryptocurrency and digital assets in blockchain. But of course, we all remember that this started in 2008, right after the global financial crisis. And now here we are more than 10 years later, and we are discussing whether central banks are going to create their own cryptocurrency, their own digital assets. Cryptocurrency is now the, on the conversation and the, the lips of policymakers and, and thought leaders and governments around the world. As we discussed, Facebook, good morning, Jason, good morning. Good morning, everyone. And now we're also going to welcome Director of Japan Security Token, Mr. Keito Ochi. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to switch seats with the special advisor? Uh, Kevin uh, Keito Ochi is the special advisor with the, the congressman here. Maybe if they could sit together. Oh, Chai, is that OK? Yeah. <laughs> we're just going to do a little logistics shuffling. It's all for you anyway. Yeah, Jason. Look at that, I love... It's called the melody chair. It's, got, it's, it's musical, musical chairs. Chair. Huh? Okay. And now that we're all comfortable. Um, so let me just introduce myself and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves as well and what we're all doing in blockchain. So my name is Angie Lau. I'm editor-in-chief, CEO, and founder of Forecast.News. And this is a new global media agency that is designed to cover all things blockchain, cryptocurrency, and DLT. I am a former uh, Bloomberg Television anchor. I've spent 20 years uh, in journalism. And I believe that our future is being told as we speak. And it is, I believe, our duty, my duty as a journalist, to really translate the stories that are evolving around us to a mainstream audience around the world. And that's what I'm doing in blockchain. And right next to me is Joshua Ashley Clayman. Please uh, introduce yourself to the crowd. What are you doing in blockchain? Thanks. I've been asking my que myself that question for years. Yeah. So I, I got into this space when I was at a global law firm. And I started several years ago and led for multiple years our global blockchain practice before starting out on my own. So I have Clayman LLC, which is a law firm, and also Inflection Point Blockchain Advisors, which is a consulting firm. I also chair the legal working group of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, and I also write for Forbes about blockchain and crypto. Thank you. Congressman. Uh, as you know, my name is Jason. I'm a legislator member of a, a parliament here in Taiwan, and I focus on developing progressive legislation 
for cryptocurrency and developing countrywide policy for uh, blockchain technology and innovation. Thank you. My name is Takemoto, and I used to be a vice minister of finance uh, almost 10 years ago. And uh, at that time, you know, I felt something, uh, the N or dollar, or this kind of money uh, had something to not to solve the, some problem. Uh, for example, sending money to other country, it costs too much. Uh, in order to resolve those problems, you know, the cryptocurrency appeared. I think so. Hi, my name is Kevin K. Ochi. Uh, I am a, I, I still am a political pundit back home in Tokyo, in Japan, on a national TV. I also help facilitate the crypto uh, blockchain legislative organization, along with which uh, Congress and Takemoto chairs. And I'm also a uh, director at the Japan Security Token Business Association. I'm looking Thank you. forward to our conversation. Hi, my name is Hock Lai. I'm the founding president of the Singapore FinTech uh, Association, uh, one of the world's largest uh, FinTech association with more than 330 corporate members and uh, international partnerships in more than 35 countries. And uh, many of you would have known that Singapore is one of the leading FinTech hub, but uh, we are also fast becoming the next uh, financial blockchain hub. Just over the weekend, the Bank of International Settlements just announced that they are setting up their innovation hub in Singapore. And as we know that uh, central bank digital currency is uh, one of the hot things and that uh, Singapore is a leading proponent in this space. Hope to share more with you later. Thanks. Thank you so much. So we have Singapore, we have Japan, we have Taiwan, and we have the US. This is really a global space. Everyone is talking about, let's start there, Facebook Libra. Even though this cryptocurrency digital asset space has been froth with a lot of players and a lot of projects and a lot of platforms. And yet all of a sudden, it reaches uh, a very uh, mainstream level because tech giants uh, led by Facebook is now talking about putting the Libra project for a global consumer base in one year's time. Josh, I want to start with you. As an attorney from the US, where are you seeing Facebook Libra in terms of changing the conversation in the US and around the world? So thank you. Um, and by the way, nothing to say is legal advice or investment advice. I think with Facebook and with Libra, I think it's really opening up the conversation and people are starting to take very seriously in the US, even those who may have doubted things. Um, the idea that blockchain and crypto are for real and that it is not just smaller emerging companies that are going to want to have a piece of it. One important thing I will just say, and I, I must say, in the US, we definitely see Asia as being a dominant force in this space. I would like to note that with respect to US regulations, and I'm sure we may touch on some of the things in a moment or later, but one of the challenges is that people say, okay, well, you know, Facebook based, you know, in the US, that they're concerned about WeChat and the dominance of companies like that. But the thing is, because of some of the challenges with US regulations, Libra Association is in Switzerland. It's not even in the US. So I think that says a lot. It says a lot. It's based in Switzerland, but at the same time, if it's going to tap into U.S. base, it still has to apply uh, U.S. regulatory law from the SEC to the CFTC and, and everyone in between. And there is a huge debate right now as to whether or not it's a currency or it's a security. Is it driving innovation to Asia? I mean, that's certainly what it feels like. Josh? I think in many ways it is to Asia and, and to Europe, frankly, to all sorts of places where the U.S. is not. As many of you may be aware, and some may not, but happy to fill you in, a lot of the regulations in the U.S., particularly around securities, they're transaction-based or principle-based. They're not based on the actual characteristics of the digital asset themselves, as they may be in certain other countries and jurisdictions. So what that means for those, even, even companies that may be located in Asia, if you're dealing with U.S. persons, either as customers 
or as users of your service, you need to be wary and knowledgeable about US laws because they may apply. Um, so I would say just in my personal practice, there are many great projects where they're just avoiding the US entirely. And they're setting up base in Taiwan, in Japan, in Singapore. What is this flood of interest that is coming to Asia as a result of what feels like a stricter regulatory environment in the US? Um, so, yeah, I think the, uh, the announcement of Libra is in general a boost to this industry. What we have seen in this industry for the past you know, 24 months is a lack of mainstream participation. And what, what, what's, what's been lacking is actually the official recognition of the industry's legitimacy. What, what happened for you know, a platform like Facebook, who is actually widely recognized and it's been verified, tested, it, make an entry to this space, uh, whether or not it will be successful, it's another story. But I think in general, it's a boost to this to this industry. And certainly, I'm hopeful that its experiments can uh, be more in all encompassing and make it an actual platform and a, a tool set for financial inclusion. However, interestingly, when Facebook announced Libra, I was happened to be in Washington D.C. I had been in the D.C. at the time for a delegation visit. I actually met with uh, members of the Congress, uh, member of the uh, House and uh, members of the Senate, and who uh, actually expressed their concern over the uh, overreaching power of Libra. And what, f what ended up following is the, uh, the announcement of the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, calling for um, a hearing and a EU parliament and other countries, uh, uh, lawmakers and legislators calling for Libra to stop its uh, development. So I think I wouldn't see it as, as a negative signal. I actually see it as a wake-up call for this community to really stand up and then get your regulations ready and complete. Now, 2019 will be the year of regulation and then uh, get ready because this industry is about to go mainstream. So I'm uh, bullish and uh, uh, I think it just in general in politics, politicians are disconnected with uh, technology, except me. Um, I think we need to provide the politicians more opportunities for education and communication with the industry and help politicians to create better laws better regulations that would end up, you know, uh, providing the win-win uh, solution for the general public, the protection of consumer, as well as the industry and the national interest. So one of the news that uh, coming out of Taiwan is FFC's decision on STO and providing that regulatory guidance. There has been pushback, however, from the community saying that 30 million NTD is not enough, it's not even a Series A that allows projects to healthily fundraise. Is this the kind of regulatory guidance that from uh, th that is an, a little bit of an imbalance to what the community says that it needs? And how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think unfortunately the step that the FSC is taking is rather conservative. And, and FSC, uh, as I shared last Friday, published a set of guidelines stimulating the uh, STO issuing. And, and there's been a lot of uh, concern that this is a rather smaller scale and is lacking enthusiasm from the community. Um, I would call this as a, a pilot program. And I think over time that we are receiving, or at, at least FSC is receiving uh, feedback from the community and then calling for the adjustment of the, um, um, the scale and as well as the uh, openness to the general uh, participation. And certainly I'm standing on the opposite side of the, uh, this, this rather conservative uh, set of guidelines and I will continue to work and strive to push for a open up of a more uh, uh, inclusion and a more global facing uh, set of rules that will be modified in the, in the months to come. 
Takamoto-san, do you think that Japan is, is also trying to help lead the way? It was very interesting at the G20 that we first had this cryptocurrency uh, conversation amongst global leaders. Can you tell us a little bit more about where Japan hopes to provide leadership in this kind of regulatory minefield? To tell the truth, our country, Japan, is uh, uh, just a developing country as far as the cryptocurrency is concerned. That's my impression. Uh, Taiwan, Singapore, United States, all of those countries, the advanced country, uh, judging from the, this viewpoint. Okay? Uh, to tell the truth, you know, uh, when we discuss about the cryptocurrency, you know, uh, some of the, our legislation, quite against, quite against, should be prohibited. That's a one, one faction of our legislation. But I am, we are not that, that opinion. We, if it's uh, useful for our economy, we should use that. However, in order to prevent some defect, such kind of money laundering or the uh, money flow, uh, in order to prevent those things, you know, we have to invent some scheme. So, therefore, uh, two years ago, you know, we have uh, uh, voluntary controlling organization we established. And uh, some of the members, uh, as a member of this organization, uh, they are doing their own business. However, uh, ICO has uh, some problem still. So, you know, we are going to event STO. It's uh, supported by the asset. Uh, this is a new, uh, new idea, I think. Uh, we are going to uh, enlarge this uh, kind of uh, scheme uh, in Japan. Mm. Uh, in order to do that, you know, we have to study so many things from mm -hmm. foreign countries. Yes. With what are you seeing in Japan? Um, so Japan positioned itself as a, 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 at least we're trying to be a leader in this uh, sector, this uh, cryptocurrency uh, v virtual asset uh, sector. Um, Japan takes pride in uh, being becoming the first uh, country to implement uh, uh, virtual asset uh, registration policy. And many of the FATF, uh, Financial Action Tax Force uh, regulations, the, the updated ones were under the influence of Japanese policies. So uh, there are some, uh, for example, there are like AML, well, MMs is, is pretty much um, is like common sense, but uh, CFT, uh, <clears throat> CDD, CTR. Uh, CDD stands for Customer Due Diligence, CS, C, STR stands for Suspicious transaction report and registration, and, uh, and those are the uh, new updated regulation that uh, FATF is trying to uh, implement, and they are something that uh, Japan has uh, recommended. And we believe that we have a sort of like a leading policy within uh, the cryptocurrency or VA community. But I, I, I certainly think that. Uh, uh, Libra uh, is a game changer because it really stood up against the existing banking system and the vested interests that are pretty much out there. And But then it also raises a question of what exactly asset is when it comes to what I, I'm sure uh, tech giants like Google and uh, these other players will probably jump in after, you know, Facebook. I believe, and uh, but then it also raises a question of what are they going to be trading? Now, Google and, and Facebook also was under the investigation uh, uh, by the Congress and Senate uh, that they were they had these uh, data, you know, man, data or like data breach issues, uh, and then people were also selling data um, on Facebook, and th those are the things that. Um, that, are they assets? Are they commodities? Are they going to be trading that, or are they simply going to be another Lakuten or eBay? Or th those are the things that. And then also, if they run on their own platform, are they going to be using, calling this an, a uh, uh, utility token, or um, 
what what exactly is a utility token? There there's still are unclear. Uh, there's a unclear. Uh, definition on security. Under Jap J uh, Japan, under FSA, security tokens are regulated under the uh, Payment Act, Payment Settlement Act, whereas uh, security token are uh, actually under the regulation of secu security law or financial instrument uh, and exchange law. So there are two f different uh, systems, yeah. legal system that regulates, mm -hmm. and there's a divide between these uh, two uh, sets of uh, yeah. uh, crypto, a blockchain platform, utility and security. So those are the things that we need to discuss with Jason and uh, with other panels, yeah. I guess. And in Singapore, SGX, MAS, I was just there a couple of weeks ago, uh, and Subnendo Kupta is, is talking about you know blockchain for the monetary authority in Singapore. How is that also shifting the environment of innovation in Singapore as you see it? I view the announcement by the Facebook as uh, positive. I think it will accelerate conversations among regulators to provide the uh, regulatory certainty on cryptocurrency. Because uh, let's, let's agree that uh, with uh, regulatory certainty, you improve the, the standard, the trust, and eventually uh, attract uh, more institutional uh, interest into the space of blockchain and cryptocurrency. And uh, even before the announcement by uh, Facebook, I see that uh, quite a number of uh, countries in Southeast Asia are already instituting uh, regulations and legislation around uh, cryptocurrency, uh, notably uh, Philippines, uh, Thailand, even uh, Malaysia. They, uh, in Philippines, I understand there are more than 40 crypto uh, exchange licenses uh, being issued already. So uh, I think uh, all these uh, are good and a lot of the regulations are about like, protecting uh, consumer interests like uh, segregating of uh, customer accounts, uh, uh, strengthening the cybersecurity uh, measures and uh, of course uh, fighting financial crime like having the proper KYC process so that uh, AML and CFT can, can, can be uh, uh, better strengthened. So I think overall it is good for the uh, industry, even though we might not know whether uh, Facebook uh, Libra will be successful. But one thing for sure, Singapore, this early this year, we just uh, passed the Payment Services uh, Act. And definitely, uh, if it is a payment tokens for Libra, they will require to uh, apply for a payment license in Singapore. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, one of the most um, fascinating debates that are emerging on stage in this audience and around the globe is whether or not we do open source peer-to-peer -peer in the purest sense of what blockchain was derived to be versus closed system that is controlled by central banks around the world, which arguably gave us the very... Uh, almost nearly catastrophic capital event that occurred more than 10 years ago. Are we going to position ourselves this way again with digital assets? Where is this balance between control from regulators and what a global economic system is demanding, which is decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, without manipulation? How do you balance that here on stage? I think that's a huge challenge. I mean, certainly within the US, regulators are tasked with competing goals, right? They're supposed to basically foster innovation and not prevent it, at least. They're supposed to be techno technologically neutral in terms of their regulation. But at the same time, they have to protect consumers. They have to protect retail investors, the Main Street investors, um, who may not have the financial wherewithal or the investing sophistication to figure things out. And then when you layer on top of that, some of the other crises, like opioid crises and other types of challenges um, in terms of illicit uses, I think it's really tough for regulators. But I do think that we are seeing again and again that people want this, even with respect to, for example, ETFs, um, exchange-traded funds, and exchange-traded exchange products in the US. I mean, they haven't been approved yet, right? 
And the rationale in part is market manipulation concerns, but also to protect retail investors. But retail investors are clamoring for this, right? They can already gain exposure to it directly by purchasing things on an exchange, you know, digital assets directly. So I think um, it's not something that I, I can solve, but it certainly is a difficult balancing act. Well, th there's no doubt regulators got in the act when ICOs uh, exploded and where, you know, 90, more than 90% of the projects that, that raised money through ICOs, uh, most re a lot of retail investors got hurt. There's no doubt the regulatory uh, uh, language got much more strict. But are we in this nexus right now where there is a danger of taking over innovation instead of allowing innovation to fro flow freely. So <clears throat> one of the uh, largest concerns in this industry is how is transaction being used and where is it used for and, and who is it transacted to. And, and so financial regulators and legislators around the world are concerned about the bad actors doing bad things. And uh, certainly I think there is a fine line between disruptive technology and responsible innovation. And we need to strike a balance between the two. So one of the, the things that I think I recently been uh, paying a lot of attention is the uh, FedHuff's ruling, uh, which just came out on June 22nd. They had an annual meeting in uh, uh, Orlando, Florida, in the United States, basically ask all member countries to start regulating uh, FASPs. FASPs is financial, uh, virtual asset service providers, which means anything related to uh, cryptocurrency, including exchanges uh, and other related services. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, we're actually ahead of FATF. Uh, in November last year, uh, I proposed the amendment to the uh, anti-money laundering law to include uh, virtual assets into the AML law. Uh, which we've already conducted a wide range uh, survey and pretty sophisticated onboarding KYC procedures uh, for this industry. So, so I think uh, whether or not regulators will embrace it, I think this um, uh, money laundering, this financial crime or terrorist financing uh, topics must be addressed. And it is up to this community and certainly people in this room to stand up for the challenges and to really provide the solutions and uh, mechanism and collaborating with regulators in your own country to make this a safe and a sustainable and uh, long-term developing environment for the, for the industry and for the people who use the service and its, its tool for the good of humanity. Thank you, Jason. I, I think Singapore is very interesting as well because it's not only what's happening in Singapore, it's also a gateway to Southeast Asia. And so we have Indonesia, we have Thailand, we have a really incredible population of close to a billion people for Southeast Asian uh, countries. How is cryptocurrency being thought of in a regulatory sense in Southeast Asia, and, and is Singapore providing that guidance to a degree in which you're comfortable? Yeah, okay. Um, for example, like uh, in May last year, the, our regulator uh, came out with a consultation paper on the recognized market operator, streamlining it, uh, uh, split, splitting it into three tiers to encourage uh, more innovative uh, exchanges like uh, STO exchanges to come on board. Uh, and just uh, last month, we have the first uh, applicant into our regulatory sandbox, uh, which is a STO uh, player. So, uh, so we, we continue to, to uh, uh, be open and progressive in, in, all, in all this, hoping to, to uh, provide some kind of benchmark for the neighboring countries. Uh, Indonesia is definitely a very interesting country uh, in early this year. They classify cryptocurrency as a commodity. And of course, they still ban uh, uh, payments of cryptocurrency. But uh, I, I think uh, this is a country of 260 million population. Every year, 5 million in the new, newborn babies. Uh, in next three to five years, it will be a very interesting country to be in. 
uh, Thailand continues to be uh, quite uh, uh, progressive in, in, in this space. They are the first to regulate uh, ICOs in May last year. And uh, even uh, in, in August uh, last year, they allow bank subsidiaries to be involved in crypto activities. And early this year, they, I think they, they issued three uh, crypto exchange licenses and one broker license and one dealer license. Philippines, uh, obviously for Philippines, uh, they have a lot of uh, domestic uh, helpers uh, overseas. So crypto is uh, for remittance place is, is, uh, is critical to them. In, in 2017, they already uh, let require uh, cryptocurrency players to, to apply for license under their remit, remittance and transfer uh, regime. And uh, to date, they already have more than 40 uh, licensed uh, crypto uh, exchanges. And uh, just uh, mid of uh, last year, they, uh, August and, and December, they provide more uh, certainty on how to conduct uh, ICO. And they even have a special economic uh, zone uh, to encourage uh, the development of uh, what they call as the crypto value of Asia in this uh, Kayagan uh, uh, area. And uh, hope that, uh, and they even uh, created a self regulatory organization to facilitate uh, the development of uh, the crypto industry in the Philippines. So, uh, and for Malaysia, uh, they took a, a different approach. Uh, early this year, they, they have a blanket ban uh, and, and then classify all kinds, all ICOs are securities. And then they require. Uh, all uh, tokens uh, arising from uh, ICO activities to, to be listed on recognized market operator exchanges. And I think uh, this month they just issued three licenses for their crypto exchange. So as you can see, uh, in Southeast Asia, these jurisdictions, they recognize the potential of the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry, and they are already providing more regulatory certainty to, to to drive the, the adoption of this industry. So uh, in general, I think it's good and, and I welcome uh, more uh, crypto and blockchain players to, to set up their base in Singapore because all the Southeast Asia countries are within four hours flight uh, from Singapore. So Singapore provides a very good base for them to operate if they are interested in the Southeast Asia region. Thank you. One of the most interesting things I think about blockchain and cryptocurrency and, de and, and uh, digital assets is the uh, ability for nations that adopt it to leapfrog economically into the global world stage. How are you seeing it for Taiwan? How are you seeing, well, Japan is a developed nation already, um, but for uh, you know those in Southeast Asia and those across Asia, how are you seeing this leapfrog effect and how regulators and policymakers can encourage or participate in that? So um, obviously in Taiwan, we are doing a holistic approach. So not only we develop a, probably the Asia's first uh, STO uh, regulatory framework, although which is a little bit conservative, but we will make uh, moderation, uh, uh, modification over time. But we are also addressing blockchain as a policy um, uh, driver. Uh, we are now developing uh, different uh, implementations across uh, public, academic, and the private sector. Uh, for example, we will be issuing a uh, new national EID, uh, which is a, our uh, digital identity system, uh, well, which will consolidate our healthcare data uh, social security data and all sorts of different data so that the uh, uh, different government departments can talk to each other uh, on this on this platform so we are in we, we, we treat this this mechanism or tool as an enabler uh, which will use to enable uh, industries to adopt this technology uh, particularly industries that are already uh, serve as the strength uh, uh, in, for Taiwan. Uh, for example, our ICT industry, our semiconductor industry, our hardware industry that are the integral part of the uh, blockchain ecosystem. Uh, when, when 5G uh, finally comes, how can we make a, uh, a decentralized computing 
an essential part of the every device that we use and making the uh, transaction of the value and the information easily accessible to everyone and every corner uh, to the world. So in Taiwan, we treat this as an experiment and we also see Taiwan as a lab for innovation. And we wanted to open up for the, the globe to uh, participate and come here, you know, experiment and then uh, scale up uh, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, in order to prevent the money laundering, you know, uh, we are thinking of, uh, however, uh, two theaters a uh, uh, few years ago, we enacted uh, the so-called uh, social safety number. This is uh, for the, all the people of Japan. However, only 10 to 10 percent are utilized. Therefore, it's not so effective. Uh, judging from this fact, I think, you know, uh, for example, uh, the same code, name, birthday, or something that, like that, all the uh, people, all the enterprise can have those information. Then there is uh, no risk uh, for money laundering, I think. However, to tell the truth, Japan, in case of our country, main bank, big bank, Mitsubishi was so, so, such kind of thing, had so many information compared with the local bank. Therefore, if the local bank can make a loan to some people, but this people, if he had some defect, you know, local bank don't know like that, but the big bank, mega bank, knows everything. They, are, they never make a loan to those people. Such a difference we have. Therefore, even if, you know, those new system uh, invent, uh, invented, you know, it's very difficult to apply to all the, all the people, all the enterprise. That's uh, what I feel like that. Therefore, the people, some people, uh, keep uh, some asset in Hong Kong or some, I have, I had so many things. However, uh, it's uh, still a very difficult thing, but we should do that, we should do that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very ironic thing in that, you know, we do have regulation shopping. Um, we have projects who are trying to look for the most comfortable regulatory environment to foster and nurture innovation, which means that, you know, when you're uh, slightly too conservative or, you know, you're too highly regulated, there is a danger of a brain drain. Um, I wonder, Josh, you know, as you advise clients and, and projects from around the world, it's so fragmented. Is it a commodity? Is it a utility token? Is it a security? Is it what, I mean, is it a currency? And so how do you provide guidance as you take a look at this global landscape and all of the regulators who are either doing this in a silo or you know in regions like Southeast Asia and or together just you know out on stage Japan and Taiwan how do you navigate this very fragmented regulatory landscape so Number one, I don't do it alone, right? There are many different types of crossing laws, as you mentioned, yes. many of which can apply at the same time. I mean, from the US perspective, as you noted, I mean, a, a digital asset could be a commodity, a security. The IRS says it's property. You know, FinCEN says it may be the same as money. I think one of the challenges is if you're going to involve the US, you can't do it halfway. Right? You need to really have someone run down all of the issues for you. And that may be expensive and it may be time consuming. But in the event that you comply with a number of regulations, but you miss some, that doesn't absolve you of the need to comply from the regulator's views. So I think that's why a lot of projects, at least at the outset, in many cases, if they're selling digital assets, they try to exclude the US. I definitely think that regulators and legislators within the US are trying to make certain changes, and I, I don't want to take up too much time. I'll just say this last thing. A lot of times we hear in the US that people are searching for additional clarity, particularly under the securities laws, but other laws as well. And I think 
and I've been saying this for a while, I think they're not really looking for clarity. I think the regulators have been clear that a lot of laws apply. People are looking for different answers. They're looking for legislators to make laws. And that's why I think what you guys are discussing here is so powerful. And what you mentioned, Jason, earlier about the need for new laws. The right answers are evolving. The right answers um, are the wrong answers when different questions arise, which happens every other day here in this industry. And so how do you keep up? Our regulators, our policymakers, our politicians enabled intellectually, professionally, with experience to have these conversations with authority. <laughs> Turn it off. So a cryptocurrency or VA, uh, virtual asset, by nature, the fact that it's, it runs on blockchain means dis being decentralized. That itself already means that it's, it's totally unconventional and very difficult. It's a different animal. It's hard to regulate. It's, I mean, decentralized means hard to regulate. That's what it means by nature. So uh, as we, I mentioned in Japan, security tokens and, um, uh, and utility tokens are falling under different category. Security tokens are under Financial Instruments Ex Exchange Act, which is securities law. And Payment Service Act uh, runs, uh, rules the, uh, the, uh, the uh, utility tokens. But then what if somebody decides to use utility tokens to buy uh, securities? What happens then? And what if there's a, a derivative uh, product involved? Then it's, it really gets messed up, and regulators are like, pretty much, you know, racking their head, you know, to find out what to solve this problem. But it, it's, a, it's a different animal, and it's very difficult to regulate. And that, this is why when Facebook made its uh, claim, um, when they made the announcement that they're releasing this new platform, that is actually going to, you know, basically rock the world. And I thought it was a game changer because of that. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for this, uh, the, the start of this conversation to kick off the many, many conversations that you will be having over the next two days at the Asia Blockchain Summit. I want to thank each and every one of our respected panelists from around the world for joining us. And, you know, I think that this conversation really kicks off something very important that we must ask ourselves. As digital currency arises with central banks trying to figure out how they too can issue digital currency. Is that the same as decentralized cryptocurrency where we have very finite amount and it is peer to peer and it is completely decentralized? That I think is an emerging debate of which you'll continue. So thank you very much.